There was a guy, I hate to tell it too, too publicly, I mean, uh, he was a, a Vietnam veteran, and I don't think he was quite right. And uh, he's a Steve, but I don't like his common name. It is. And it was the first one that came up on the internet, and I was booking shows, and I was losing shows left and right. People would say, well, we went to your, your and we looked you up on the internet, and we cannot have anyone come to our uh, school or library or wherever it was, or our festival, who looks like that. I go, what are you talking about? And I go and I check it out, and the guy stands near naked on the beach. He's a big fat guy wearing a scuba mask and flippers and uh, holding <laughs> guns. He's got all these assault rifles and things, and he's just a nutcase. Thank you. And I thought, oh, hell. And, no, okay. And I, I'm, I'm spending most of my time writing back, that's not me, that's not me. You know, keep, keep, keep looking, keep looking. So finally, uh, I, I thought, well, hell, my, the book is rambling, and I uh, talked to my agent at the time. I said, he said, you might as well just incorporate this whole thing, just rambling Steve Gardner. The Rambling Mind Project is the book, and so the music kind of thing. And so then that solved a lot of problems. I just didn't get work at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was it, was, that was when, in 1980, was, when you first got here? Uh, no. Um, I, there was no internet at that time, so it didn't matter. It didn't know? matter, right? And so I was. I was, was that in Japan? I was, I was in the states. That was in in Japan. I played music in the states. I came over in the uh, well up through the seventies, but um, as a young guy, you know, you don't have much of a future playing this kind of music because you just you haven't had any experience, and that was a, an interesting thing you've got to grow into. You wait, know, wait, my, wait, 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 playing this kind of music, you see you had more well, experience, I was, what do you mean? Well, what it is, is um, uh, the, um, blues being the, the American mother of the music that came after it, which was really jazz and what we might consider country music or bluegrass music, pretty much the, the blues is the, the, the mother of all of, of that, mm -hmm. because it was the essence of putting the, the living experience and the beat down. And so you had everybody singing like this, and, and my theory is that, that music comes from the sound you hear around you. You won't find a guy sitting, in, in my opinion, if he's never left the cotton field or he's never left the, the riverside, he's not going to be sitting out there with a saxophone pulling his brains out with these discordant chords playing jazz because he doesn't ever hear that. That's right. He, if he hears that, a storm is coming. That's not a natural thing. And so when you listen to this high, lonesome sound in the Virginias, all these folks came from, from Europe. They were Irish, uh, Scottish, various immigrants. And most of them, like all of us, they can remember the first verse of the song, but wow, they didn't really learn it by heart, so they just make up the other verses. So you'll hear a million songs that you say, that sounds like the last song, but all they say, you know. So they sing in this high, what they call high, lonesome sound, high voice, play real fast. Well, if you live in the mountains and the wind blows all the time and your window doesn't fit too well, all you hear is this, and you get so mentally, even subconsciously, you start humming to that sound, you know, and all this high, lonesome music is sung like that. Lots of sounds because they're emulating the sound. And when you get down where I grew up, I grew up right on the edge of the delta, Spent a lot of time right around Yazoo City and then going up. That's right on that delta edge. And so as it flattens out, you know, you end up making long, low sounds to be able to hit your neighbor or be able to talk. Oh, hey, Billy Boy, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Right? And then they'll be able to hear it and they can call back. Mm -hmm. But they'll never hear it. You go, hey, hey, you know, that's all you know, lost. To never go. And so the, the, the distance between uh, houses, I mean, in those days, uh, even my dad growing up, he lived up in the, the, actual, in the actual Delta. He grew okay. up in Sunflower, uh, Mississippi, near Sunflower, Mississippi, on the Sunflower River. And as he's uh, 
going, the fastest they could travel was to walk. And therefore, all your music had a walk. And they, they knew that when you got there, you're gonna have to go to work. So they didn't walk fast, right. you know? <laughs> and, so, you. and so as they're, they're walking, so a lot of the songs, even the, the little diddly songs that, that they make up about what they didn't want to do, still had all that beat in him. When he would kind of break out, when we'd go fishing, he'd break out into a funny song. He'd always have a weird beat for me because I didn't grow up in that flat land. That wasn't my young area. I grew up kind of in South. So you probably the same too. He sang a little bit and he played um, uh, rhythm on what had been, he learned on Bones, you know, kind of the same as the Irish and Scottish playing Bones. He played cable knives. But isn't uh, that, that's very Irish too. I guess it is. They do that spoons and things and the the French uh, Cajun people play spoons. You know, you'll go to a little session uh down on the, the kind of the prairie kind of uh below Shreveport, you know that right, right, there, right. that's where thought is from oh, Shreveport. Okay, so he's like yeah. the prairie. But before we go any further, oh. let me welcome oh. you and thank you for being a <laughs> oh. part of this. Oh Lance, podcast. thank you very much. Thank you. We've known each other for uh, we've known of each other for as long as you've been here. Wow. You came here in nineteen eighty, I've known you. Right. right, and you have family from all the Ooh, well, <laughs> They're all usually working with tax people now. <laughs> I got big fans in the tax right, right, department. Right, right. <laughs> let's, let's get right back to the bones. Oh, yeah. They the bones and stuff. So tell me, because I, oh. I went to an Irish pub once, and they had spoons. And they had spoons, two spoons together. Yeah. were doing that and the elbow and stuff. And the woman came to me and she said, you're obviously not Irish. And I said, <laughs> actually, actually, my great-great-grandmother was German-Irish. Wow, wow, that's great. That's and I great. said, but you're right, I'm not fully Irish. <laughs> well, they have a, a little bit of a different rhythm. You know, I mean, basically, uh, even the string band my dad, Big Steve, played in, uh, it was for dancing. And as the, the times grew in the transportation, in my opinion, as transportation uh, became available and became faster. Dancing became faster. A real, uh, well, you know, in the old, in the old days, the the transportation was slow, and so the waltz was your only opportunity to meet your future ex husband mm-hmm. wife. Mm-hmm. So you waltz around and then you two step, and that was an easy that was an easy reach kind of thing. And there were a lot of little fiddle two steps uh, as well. People mm-hmm. played fiddle music. It had the biggest voice. Right, so you're unamplified, you need an instrument with a big voice. And so you need a fiddle or an accordion because they have a big, big voice. voice. And um, you know, the companion piece to the to, to the, the the violin is the mandolin, right? Mm-hmm. So the mandolin's the companion to the fiddle, it plays the same parts. And a harmonica, if you could have gotten one, I mean they were they became popular uh, after the turn of the century. But of course, that's um, a reed instrument, and you have to be careful with it. You know, uh, it it also will fill in and play the same parts as a as a fiddle. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a it plays m- both melody and rhythm. It's another voice, and so yeah, people would play uh, would choose some sort of instrument that would suit the the sort of the, mm-hmm. the people that they're playing for and the time and and. Uh, it would speed up or slow down. What got you into music when you were a little kid? I mean, like, how did you grow up? You told me you have oh. a younger sister. It was just the two I of do. Her name's Renee. She's mm-hmm. fabulous. Took care of my uh, mom, uh, Miss Sally, when she had dementia. But uh, she was um, well, a few years younger than me. But my, um, I was just a little bit ahead, so I could hang out with uh, Big Steve. And those guys, and my dad, and uh, my uh, kind of adopted uncle, and they played for these square dance parties. That's when you first. And so that was in the 1950s, and so okay. in that sense, that was what was going on. I mean, you've got mm-hmm. everything's cracked open just a little bit. They're they're remembering the music they learned in the 40s, right? right? I mean, right. basically, we're we're all a little bit behind, and the music that we really remember, if you grew up in that kind of environment, is I call it grandmother music. Okay. So your mother's going to teach you a song, not that she knew, she learned it from her mother or her grandmother. And so it's all grandmother music. That's right, right. And so we would uh, sit around uh, with an old 78 record player, and my grandmother had a collection of red records, and they were, right. you'd get them by the month, and they would be cowboy songs, or they would be 
hillbilly songs, uh, you know, Blue Tail Fly or whatever was going on, and we'd sing along or, you know, we wouldn't sing along. But as soon as we got up stomping and dancing, my grandmother would run us out of the house with a broom. Really? Because it bounced the needle on That's top right. of the record. That's right. That's right. With the wooden floors and everything. <laughs> That's right. Out of the house. That was only three nights. It wasn't any religious reasons. No, it? no, no. It was just no. because it messed up the records. It messed up the records. But they would dance. My grandmother danced. You know, this is a time where, you know, maybe you right. up, did your folks well, dance. They did. Know? They did. And that a little bit. My father did a little you bit. You know, they may, may or may not even go out. My dad used to come home when my mom and dad were really getting along pretty good when we were still young. I mean, you know, relationships like they are. But he'd come home and they'd turn the radio up loud on the, whatever, the, whatever the music, the country station. And uh, they would dance around the kitchen you until that? they you knocked that? greens off the stove. Oh, yeah, I loved it. It was great. My grandmother danced when she was happy, and she stomped when she was mad. She would be jumping and stomping around the kitchen. So we grew up like that. So your childhood dreams were like that. Were there a lot of kids in your area? No, were, not, not, just many, not many folks. My cousins, when I grew up, uh, I, my first guitar, I started playing, playing at the guitar when I was about nine. Uh, you remember my, that? Was it because of your father? Or your... My my cousin, well, my uncle uh, played uh, guitar, mm -hmm. and um, he's what we call a guitar whooper. Okay. You know, so, and so uh, basically he just takes a big, thick pick and whacks that guitar no matter what. That's like that guitar's been bad. He's a guitar whooper, so it's no no finesse to it. Just whooping that guitar. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And that never moved me too much. Wait, but did he have any, any chords? Was there any chords? Oh, he played it? chords to it, but he just he could just whoop the daylights out of it. You know, boom, boom, you know. And um, he would, uh, when folks would, um, people would be bad to drink, and they would have a good guitar, and they'd break the neck off. He'd buy it from him for a little bit, go out to his shop, glue the neck back on, whoop that guitar until the neck came off again, you know. Really? So he would, he would, he was a... But you didn't like that. That wasn't your kind of music. It didn't move me too much. I just didn't, that just didn't grab me. So and what was the moment for you when you did Well, that? I mean, I was, I was certainly trying to whoop the guitar, but I was left-handed. Okay. And I'd take the strings off my cousin's guitar until he'd catch me. And then he would whoop me. And I would have to whoop the guitar. What do you mean to the strings off the guitar? I don't well, see, um, if you're right-handed... Because the, 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 the thickest to the... Ah. That's right. So I, I, I first started out playing, uh, trying to play right-handed. That didn't work for me at all. I'm just okay. too left-handed. And so then I played the, the guitar upside down. I started learning to play the guitar upside down. But your thumb has to do all the work of your fingers. You know, because the thin the strings, you know, and the thick ones on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So these strings, are, these fingers get lazy. And there are some guitar players can sure play like that. Elizabeth Cotton played with just these two fingers, and she played the guitar upside down. Um, of course, uh, she was left-handed too. She was left-handed, and so she, you know, she could play that thing. Played a lot, Freight Train, and all those famous, you know, uh, songs. Albert King, uh, he's no relation to BB, although sometimes if it looked like he was gonna pick up a girl, they might say so. But anyway, he would. He played upside down. So you know all the left-handed players. So well, you know, Jimi Hendrix was left-handed. Left -handed player. Look at this. Yeah. So, uh, I never but, thought of that. That's but, right, he's left-handed. But a lot of my friends who play music just say, you just a left-handed guitar. Oh, but your parents, <laughs> nobody tried to force you to become right, because during our age, our generation, mm -hmm. people tried to make you become right-handed. My uh, elementary school teachers spent a lot of time whooping on me, you know, with a, uh, a insistent Did attitude. you become right-handed? My mother uh, took over those. She said uh, because she had been sort of forced growing up by lots of um, teachers with an insistent attitude mm -hmm. on you should do this. And so although she used the word should quite often, she didn't like other people using it, you know. So uh, she, you know, stepped in. But my handwriting to this day suffers severely from, from you know, the idea as a lefty, you've got to be able to scrunch around and get your words on the line. And so penmanship was never one of those uh, points of to excel in. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so you, you started loving the guitar after you got yourself with the guitar. Well, I, I did that. My cousin took his guitar back, though. You know, he okay. just said, you know, don't take strings on my guitar. Don't touch my guitar. You know. You were actually so, taking them off and restringing. Yeah, them. I was doing it, but the tuning was optional. Right. And that's been a problem, you know, ever since. You know, people sit in with me. They go, well, what tuning is that? It's just optional. You know. 
So anyway, you get that string tension. As a kid, you're trying okay. to get stuff going. Okay. So sometimes I tune all the strings the same tension about so that I could play yeah. anything and it would sound like so, it's so, not so, half right. So you were told me, of course, we're only by ear. By all ear. of yours, by ear. So the next thing that happened, I ran into some, some fellas who, they were amazing to me. Um, they could actually pick the strings out they wanted. And then when they got tired of, uh, we, they would say, mashing the strings down, they would use a piece of metal or a, a bottle, a uh, neck, or a piece of glass and run, slide it up and down the strings and make melodies. And that just turned me on. I thought, man, that was the one. I want to try and do that. And so the combination of that has helped me to. How old were you then? Living. Oh, I was probably no. Oh, I first started. That, I wasn't. I wasn't in a teenager yet. Maybe 12, 11 or twelve when I started okay. seeing that a little bit. And these guys play on their lap and move around. Right, right. But then the guitar was lost, and the school system changed, and we had to move. And so when we moved away from from my cousins and the guitar and things like that, we moved into a little community pretty far away near Pocahontas. It's not that where I claim as a hometown. And um, I started playing harmonica a little bit. That's strange you, know, you play harmonica too. I'm going to tell you what, that's like a headache in a small box. That's what my daddy would say. Put that headache away. <laughs> that headache in a small box. Because nobody can show you how to play it. Okay. You got the thing sticking in your mouth. It's like. It's what, like what, what, made you, what was your fascination with the harmonica that made you want to get that? I could buy one for less than a dollar. Do you? <laughs> you want to see music in your life. Yeah, it was it was something I could get involved in. Nobody else was playing it, okay. and I could play it for less than a guy. Pick one up at that time for less than a dollar. Now you know. I it know. Cost nearly hundred dollars a piece. Good God! And they have so many different types too. They do. They. I went to look at them just a little bit because my brother played harmonica for oh, a while okay. and got really good. For I don't know if he continues after that, but he got really good for a while. I thought about it. But again, like you said, no one can really teach you how to do that. You have to. Time. You have to really develop your 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 sense of hearing, mm -hmm. and um, you know, after a while, uh, if if somebody doesn't just haul off and whop you one, you know, you have to be a little bit more courteous because as you're trying to learn, it's like learning the violin or something, you get a lot of bad moves. Mm -hmm. But once you start figuring out, you know, um, how to start controlling your breath a little bit and things like that, I was. Uh, at that time, uh, well, I was in uh, scouting. I love the scouting program, and I don't know if you know was a you right. I, was a I, I made it up to, to, it to made up to a, to Eagle, and it was probably one of the best experiences of my life uh, for a lot of reasons. One, you're around a bunch of guys that you're not in in a sporting competition, mm -hmm. so to speak. You know, you're in you're learning a lot about life. I, I love the program. And the other thing is that my dad uh, was the one of the assistant yeah, scout masters. Okay. And I think when you go through that phase, maybe your kids were lucky and didn't go in that tunnel. As teenagers, you go into this tunnel and, oh, my, you know, everything's better than what I have. You know, some guy's going to be better than my dad. My dad's not cool. This guy. But my goodness, you get out in the middle of the wilderness someplace and every guy there is worshiping your dad. Man, Mr. Steve, he can do this. Here. And you suddenly look at your dad and you go, different. wow, you know. He's got some skills. He does. <laughs> One of my favorite, we were up on, we were in the Smoky Mountains. We hiked a little ways on, on the Appalachian Trail. And we'd go back every other year and we we're on Mount LeConte. And uh, of course, being good, Guys, uh, we didn't prepare at all. We didn't make any reservations. The patrol leader that was supposed to make the reservation for the camping place, of course, didn't. And so we get up there. We didn't have any place to camp. We're gonna have to stay out. The uh, the sort of little uh, shelter was full. So okay, that's all right, boys. Now we have to take precautions. You know, so Big Steve goes around and says, "Now whatever you do, boys, you know, we're gonna have to put our." Our food in this thing and haul it up here so the bears don't get it. Now, everybody put your food in there. Of course, nobody wanted to put their candy in that bag, you know. <laughs> so everybody's holding out with, with their candy. So they're in their sleeping bag, munching away. Well, about midnight or so, the fire burned down. We had sung. We had made all the noise we could. Hit cans trying to scare the bears away. They're just over there laughing at us. They've seen it all. 
Man, as soon as we were in, first thing they did was um, one of the young guys was eating a candy bar. And before he could get a bite, the bear had knocked that, that candy bar out of his hand. Luckily, it wasn't a, they were black bears, right. and they wasn't ferocious. They were, they were These, hungry, but they were not angry. Right, 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 right. Oh, man, scared him dead. He's up jumping. Mr. Steve, Steve Mr. Steve, Steve, it's a bass bear. So we all get up, and we all run over to see him. And, of course, that was their diversion. They look like circus bears, one on top of the other. They pulled our packs down right? and gotten away with every bit of our food, which they all they need to do is just get the one big pack. That's right. Oh, what are we gonna do, Mr. Steve? Daddy had a big Steve had this big stick, and he turns around, and a big old sow, big mama bear, had a big jar of peanut butter stuck in her mouth. She couldn't get it open. It was, at that time it was a glass jar. Right. Why we had a glass jar, I don't know. But anyway, she couldn't get it out. And he whacked her on the, the rear end, and that big jar of peanut butter goes shooting out across, and we were all like a bunch of football players. I've got it, I've got it. We're running, trying to catch that jar of peanut butter because you know we thought we we're going to die. We spent the right. morning with on nothing to eat. And somebody caught it. Uh, maybe I don't. I don't know who Randy Green or Steve. Or anyway, someone caught the thing. Well, that's all we had. We lived to tell the story. Yeah, Attacked by bears, bears and everything. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. So how old were you around then? Oh, probably 18? about 14, 14, 13 or 14. That sounds like, like a lot of fun. You know. Well, you know, for us, you know, for us, the story gets bigger. And that's right. Bigger. Of course it does. Of course it. There's still part of. I mean, there's a lot of truth in that story. There were. It, well, you know, it's one of those stories that at the time it was fun to. Like experience, but as you look back in your life, you realize, wow, you know, I'm glad I experienced that. You know, I mean, had a good uh, experience, not only with your dad, you know, I mean, saving us and we survived on peanut butter, but you know, you have a hard time and you're able to, to uh, maybe help some young kid along who, you know, the battery on his phone ran out. You go, let me tell you about the time I just survived on peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> so then from there, from, 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 from high school, and then into, did you go to college? Or I did, I did. Okay. Um, I went to uh, junior college first, or now they're called community right. college, right. which was a great experience. Southwest Mississippi Community College, junior college. Were you and studying music the whole time? No, no. Um, I, I was smart enough to realize I was, you know, just a headache in a box, you know, so... Um, no, I thought uh, at the time, in the late 70s, it was like, okay, there's sort of, we're in this wave of unemployment coming on, um, all sorts of disasters. Mount St. Helen was getting ready to blow up, where the Iran, um, you know, we had the hostages situation were going on, you know, Jimmy right, Carter was, right. was in office, we were having to drive 55 and getting tickets left and right, because nobody could do mm -hmm. that, you that's know. Right, that's right, Had you been driving your muscle car 55 mm -hmm. miles an hour. Right. You know, and so all of that sort of stuff was going on. Um, magazines were going out of business, mm -hmm. it was, you know, just pretty severe. So I was determined to be able to, to figure out some way not to have to work too hard. You know, I dodged all work all my life. Why am I going to start now? So I was made, I was studying journalism, sociology and journalism to start with. And so okay. I figured that I had better put some of these skills to work. So I liked photography and uh, beautiful I, book, I liked, by the way, your book oh, is beautiful. Thanks, thanks. Uh, that book is beautiful. We can bring that out. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, well, yeah. we'll do it. So anyway, I went on from uh, there to University of Southern Mississippi, mm -hmm. and they had a good uh, photography, photojournalism program. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I liked about it was that it was a, you're able to tell stories in some sort of visual manner. Mm -hmm. And maybe you did the same. I grew up in a storytelling. Right. No, no, I, to, I listened to all of your songs that you have on your page. Mm -hmm. I listened to every single one and was thinking about how fantastic a storyteller you are. And I haven't listened to music in a long time because the new music, I can't, I don't know what they're talking about. Ah, right, right. Yours has a tell, and you can tell what you're talking about. Each time, whatever the situation is, you can tell. Well, thanks. And I looked at your photography, too, and it's the same thing. You look at the picture, and it makes you want to know the story. Well, I, I, go through. Yeah. I found when I came out here, there were some interesting points that I hadn't thought about. Because, you know, if you grow up in the, the middle of the, the soup, so to speak, you, you never think about what it tastes like or what's in it. But when you get away from it, as in uh, the South, uh, wow, uh, 
uh, you suddenly understand, oh, there are a lot of people who never been there or don't know much about her, just know perhaps a, one good point or one bad point or several of them. So I felt, all right, a lot of people know a blue song, for example. Okay, oh, that, that must be a blue song. That's a country song or that's a whatever. But what does it look like? And so I decided that what I would do is try and make um, a, a guide, uh, in a sense, in a, a sort of a three, it, it's in it, my, that particular book is in three parts. And so it, it's sort of the basics of how the music came about. And that's from there, how it's going. Mm -hmm. So the first part is about some very good friends of mine, Willie and Annie Trotter. They lived in Maxie, Mississippi, and they were an original 40 acre and a mule uh, land grant couple. They actually got their 40 acres in the middle? Yes, they were just, uh, they were they were diehard Roosevelt uh, okay. fans. They were great. They were really good for And this is in Mississippi? That was in Mississippi. Okay. And I met them in college and uh, when I was in university. And what was really good about it, I, I was revisiting some old scouting memories. We used to go down in canoes, uh, a place called Black Creek. And we would float down that creek, and, and it was just a fun adventure, you know, just camping out, whatever. And they lived not far from Black Creek. And I was going down, I decided to go and visit because I was looking for something to photograph, you know, I understand. And I saw um, a fellow and uh, uh, an old fellow and a woman, and they were cutting a sugar cane, and they were working on a cane mill to squeeze that cane and make sorghum. My part-time job in um, high school was I was a skimmer at a cane mill. You know, there's a fellow near near us, and they were making uh, syrup. And so you cook that syrup, and you skim it off. You skim off the top, skim it off, and you keep cooking it and keep skimming it. And then a after X amount of time, when the official taster decides, then you bottle it up or can it up. And that was what I, I did. So I knew about that, and I stopped to see if they needed some help. They looked oh. Well, I realized, man, he's stronger than I am. He was working that mule and mm -hmm. getting going. And, but we just laughed, and he said, you know about this? I said, yeah. So they were making a jack-o'-lantern for their granddaughter. And, I can uh, tell you this story. <laughs> he said to his wife, he said to his wife, why are we making scary things when we already got plenty of scary things out here already? And he was collecting the, the pumpkin seeds for his chickens. That's exactly That's the picture. I hope that picture's going up. That was beautiful. I saw that and I thought, wow, that's so neat. You know? And so that was the thing. And I, I, I thought it was very appropriate for today, isn't it? You know, we spend a lot of time on the scariness without thinking about, I mean, there's always been scary stuff, but Let's work around it, you know. Yeah, we know it's over there, so let's don't go over there. Right, just right. Right. let's see how we can. Yeah. Anyway, right. but that that's made, so that meant a lot. He told me so many. They were just great. And they always had music. Now Willie didn't play. Really? So he, when you went to college, you already played. You were I playing. played. I was You'd been playing. Had you belonged to a band or something? No, guys. Just, you know, uh, I've been kicked out of several, but okay. I never really belonged. You know, harmonica play is always the the. First, well, you were, you were playing first, harmonica. You yeah. weren't playing guitar. Not at that time. I, I could play the guitar a little bit, but it was worse than the harmonica, so I had to choose between. And this is your the, first. This is your junior in junior college. In, in junior college, you already played. Yeah. You were pretty pretty handy with the harmonica already. I was all right. I could okay. I could drive a crowd out of a big room quick. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not play it right there. I was the last hire in the first five. five okay. <laughs> so then after that, so then you just got into photojournalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then where did that lead you? Uh, well, um, it, it led me into working for a, a state uh, newspaper, the Jackson Daily News. So I had a, I was recruited out of college. I had done a couple of things when I was covering some pretty hard stories uh, at the time. I, the, there was a, a big shooting in... Tupelo, Mississippi, where Elvis Presley was born, and it was a, a, an interesting area. Uh, there had been a policeman who shot a black woman. He had gone on his own to sort of, as I understand, to, to stake out uh, some businesses downtown. Someone had been breaking in, and they had gotten a lot of complaints, and so he decided he was going to catch them. And so this person came out, they're wearing a huge overcoat and had a hat down, and oh, he freaked out, he's caught him, and he's kind of freaked out and, and said, you know, uh, put up your hands, you know, uh, drop, drop whatever you drop your weapon. And the person 
um, pulled their hand out like this and something shined like a pistol and he shot them. Well, it turned out to be a, a woman who was semi or homeless or semi-homeless, destitute, and she had her baby in one arm and she had stolen canned milk for the baby. But they were it's wearing clear. all these old clothes and things. And of course, you know, well, anyway, we could go into a whole bunch of things. Sure can, yeah. A whole bunch of things. It's sad, sad no matter what. That's I mean, true. All the way around. And we can, you know, you can always look mm-hmm. back. But anyway, so what happened was uh, I was still in university. Well, this could not be resolved. And then outside uh, uh, groups got involved. And so I think that the NAACP. Uh, organize or or the Southern Freedom Foundation. I'm not sure exactly what they're anyway. They they organized some marches, and so lots of people up marching in support of of justice for the community. Okay, mm-hmm. that's great. But then across the way from Alabama, the Ku Klux Klan came okay. and they had a counter march. I mean, it's right out of a uh, John Grisham Tell novel. Yes, yes. In fact, I think in and you had to cover this. You I, I covered it uh, for about six weeks, and I was working part time for UPI. Uh, United Press International. As Is that the biggest story you cover? Oh, well, at that, as time. a college student, as a college student, right. and then I worked within for uh, Newsweek, and so I had a you know little stringer contract for them, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so we would go up there um, uh, to get in, get involved or photograph, and it was a great way to try and see um, from the middle. Okay, so I'm not uh, I'm not this person. I'm not this person. You know. And so then it escalated. Um, the, who was the guy? Geraldo Rivera, I yes, think, yes, yes. from 24. Anyway, he came. Once he and hit he town and they had the national news, well, of course, an incident's got to happen. And so uh, it did. And um, they just beat the crap out of anybody with a camera. And so I and he got, got my arm oh, broken. You? He got, really? Oh, yeah. I, oh, I got, come I got, on. Oh, yeah. yeah they, they, they just waylaid us. Anybody with a camera? Anybody with a camera? We were the calls, and so they. Who, 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 <laughs> which side are you talking about? The KKK that, that or the black side? The, the Klan and the police. The Klan <clears throat> and the police beat you like <laughs> they did, like, like a, a cheap tip, like a grill. Yeah, it was almost like my cousin. When I mean, I right, right, right. Right. Is that right? So, what did that make you feel at that time? You thought, well, well I'm done. At that, no, no, no. Uh, that's that's a, just a challenge. of what we ended up doing is we had to pick up and see if we had any gear that would work. They had, had smashed in the the top of, of uh, my camera but with a little finesse I could get it back out they didn't break, didn't break the, the prism and it had a lens hood on it so it broke that off a little bit and there, there are pictures in there uh, from that and so other friends around there were mostly going for the TV guys and so if you could just get down you know and, and as a kid adrenaline you know, mm-hmm. get you going so a couple of big whacks but definitely you know what that, that stick you know that will break you in oh broken. man so anyway, that night they were having a big rally, and so we said, "Well, let's just go," you know. And so there are a lot of a lot of guns there. Sometimes we could shoot, sometimes we couldn't. But um, the fire department was coming, and so we got a pretty, um, I suppose, rare photograph because the man who was in charge—I think they call him the Imperial Wizard—he was up from Denham Springs, Louisiana. And so to prevent the fire department uh, having a Keep, keep from having a fight with the fire department coming to put out the fire of the cross that was burning. That's what they were coming to do. It was a big, big thing. Uh, he's pushing it down, and I had uh, one of the photographs when he's actually pushing the cross uh, over. You can see it in the, the book, or show it later. And so that was that ran pretty good. That that you know gave me an idea that okay, so uh, if you keep with it, you might. Uh, be able to get something that had good play in magazines and newspapers or, around. And so I used that and it was part of the portfolio that helped me get my first job. And of course, being young and idealistic, you know, you know, wow, you know, I had a little play, you know, so I know what's going on. I didn't know the first thing about what was going on. Still don't really. But uh, joining the newspaper, I thought, okay, these guys want to tell the story, right? They want to tell you know, what's going on there? We're going to cover the community. No, they will sell advertising. <laughs> and if there's any space, we'll put what's going on in the community. Okay. Oh, man. That frustrated you to know. Oh, man, that was hard for me. I couldn't, couldn't get with it. How long were you with them then? Uh, about a, less than two years. You know, I, I, I just knew. They that kept on knocking you down. Every time you well, had a story that was worth something, they said, it, well, it was that. And it was, um, it was a corporate 
uh, sort of um, they were they were grooming they were grooming that newspaper to be sold. Okay, they, it, the USA Today chain was going to buy that. All right, and so I couldn't see that as a kid. I wanted to tell these stories. So occasionally, I, I had, you know, the photo edges were pretty good. I was covering, um, 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 at that time, some of the guys in biker, motorcycle clubs, and uh, I would uh, go with them, uh, you know, for a Thanksgiving dinner. You know, so what, what's Thanksgiving like in a big motorcycle mm -hmm. club? Oh, it was great, man. These, uh, I saw splendid lessons in leadership. How do you take a bunch of renegade road guys and, um, and get them together, Get them together to sit down, and uh, most of them wouldn't sit down, but they're drinking beer and eating turkey. Right, right, right. And uh, how do you bring? How what do you do? And so they had the big deal after shooting lots of guns and things was they had a big thing about as big as this big table that they had plowed up and filled up with water and mud. It was a big mud uh, hole, whatever, yeah. big enough to hold about ten guys. I mean, and so then they stretched the big. Uh, rope and they have a tug of war, and so that was the thing. Of course, you know if you lose, you know you're, you're, they, you get go and, yeah. and the leader, the guy that was the leader, I, I won't call his name out because I don't know if he's running from the law right now or not. But he was a he was a very interesting man. First thing he did was to to show, I mean, in leadership that we all learn is that you can you cannot uh, expect others to do things you wouldn't do. And as he's sitting there yelling at, at both sides about stuff, saying what's going to happen, he jumps right down in the middle of the mud. He's the first one. First one. Right in the middle him. of it. He's just yelling and screaming, muddy mud's up to here. And then he says, okay, somebody help me out. You know? Now somebody's coming to follow me. And wow, you wouldn't believe, man, they, of course, everybody almost wanted to lose. They're like a bunch of big kids. That's right, man. When I when I showed up the night before uh, the big the big do on that I came in and had parked my little car and somehow or another I don't know had gotten up on a, a stump or something anyway there was no way I could move out of there it had, had, I couldn't see it in the dark we're out in the woods thing but I had a bunch of harmonicas with me and the guys just didn't you know didn't know and they had an old guitar about halfway in tune and the guy started playing i said man why not sit in with you now you know it's the like, bankers mm -hmm. okay so they were having a big campfire my goodness it was we didn't see kumbaya but you know we had got all these guys about 300 pounds with guns and knives and they're all having a great time pretty soon you know i'm i'm not one of them but i'm not not I got you. And were these only guys? Were there any women? No, there? they had all their. Oh, they had the girls too. They had the girls too. Okay. Families. Some of them had families. I got you. But it was a great day. They were having things. They were having time. And so it was like, all right. And then when I got ready to go, man, do you really have to go? I said, yeah, I got to go. But you're going to help me get my car off. They just picked the they're car they're up they're and sent it out in the driveway. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, fellas. <laughs> Y'all come back. Come back. So I had gotten to know them because I gave them a fair shake. They were doing a big rally about, um, well, they, uh, uh, what did they call it? Um, abate, I mean, uh, uh, against um, helmet laws, I think. Right, 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 right. They didn't so, helmets, right. You know, so the deal is, is, is just choice. It's, uh, you know, if it had been gloves, it had been against gloves, any, any you know, kind of rule. And so I had given them a pretty square shake because I had been assigned to the store and photographed and uh, for it and interviewed them. And I like bikes. I ride bikes mm -hmm. as well. I, at that time, I was riding. I, I ride on a uh, Harley. And, and um, so I could understand it, you know. But, yeah, they got to be pretty good friends. And then some of them, you know, uh, a few years, oh, a number of years later, after I came to Japan, I came back. And one of the fellows was getting married. He was actually fixing it. He's going to get married before he goes off to the penitentiary. But anyway, we're having a big wedding ceremony, you know? <laughs> Crazy things like that. So know. when you left from, so when, once you left the newspaper, once you left there, did you... I came to Japan. I, I had uh, worked with a, a very good friend of mine. He, he died a few years ago. Charlie Cole. Um, Charlie Cole was known for winning the main award um, for the Tiananmen Square Tank Man picture, the guy holding He took that picture. He took that picture. He took the main one. Okay. Several people have a shot of the tank. And, and they also have the, the video of it. I mean, or the, the, the camera shot of it. I that's mean, that's right. They've got the whole thing where he comes in and he right. moves. But the still picture that ran around the world that, that, was that, his. that won all the awards was his Charlie Cole. 
And he and I were, were friends. We met in college. He was uh, at the Uni uh, University of Texas, Denton. And uh, his dad was in the Air Force in uh, Yakota Base. That's and he was a chaplain. And uh, his name was Newton Cole, Colonel Cole, all the way from our Lieutenant Colonel. When you, in 1980? Then in 1980. I probably saw him or knew him. Because so, I, I got out in 76, but okay. I stayed close to you. Close you by. Yeah. So he was real nice. We met. They had a little uh, place that they used to go to up in Tin Cup. And so Charles was working for a newspaper. I worked for a paper, and we were both not very happy about it. And um, we came up there, and his dad said, well, you boys uh, ought to just come out and see the world and so we decided to do it and being you know I, you know well not you know youth as they say is wasted on the young and i have to say all oh, my youth was certainly wasted and, uh, smart things you know didn't happen so i said charlie let's, let's, let's go let's do it yeah okay we, we, we'll get ready so i meet up with charlie and we get the tickets and everything i said you, you let your dad know didn't you oh yeah i mailed a letter yesterday <laughs> Oh, so man. So dad didn't have a clue. Yeah. You look up dummy in the dictionary. Right, yeah, yeah. There are our pictures right, right there. Right. Wow. You know, we're traveling over. We're traveling across the, the, and dad the water. And dad didn't have a clue. We got a book on Hong Kong. It did he have any other siblings? Did Charlie have any other siblings? He did. He was the middle child. He had an older brother that had been in the Air Force okay. and was out. And he had a younger sister. Who and was she was still staying in Japan. Was she was in Japan. Dakota. Dakota. Okay. So what happened you guys got here? Well, um, we didn't really know what to do. Somebody said, y'all need to take this bus and go to this place. So we took the bus to TCAD and, uh, wow, we're in Tokyo. Okay, uh, you better call your dad and come get us. Okay, uh, dad, can you come get us? What? You're where? You know? So anyway, he drove for hours trying to figure out he had never driven into Tokyo. Mm -hmm. But he was kind enough. Who, the father? The father. He, he had never driven. He had never driven around the base, but right. he had no reason to come to Tokyo. As for TCAT, how you find it. Had you, ever, had you ever been outside of, of Mississippi before that? I had been out, out of, I had been around the states a, a good bit. And, right. uh, but Alabama, around, to Georgia. Oh, all, Arkansas, all through those southern states. I was in North Carolina several summers okay, okay. and we had gone, but I'd never been. Is that the furthest had you been to New York? I had, I've been to New York at, uh, when I was working in North Carolina. Okay, okay. So you were so up. Uh, had been to Colorado, uh, Florida, Florida, and of course, you know, that's, that's all that area, yeah. that whole area. Yeah. But not a not a whole lot. And Colorado was the furthest you went west. Uh, I had we had been yeah at that time Colorado was the as furthest, furthest you went. So then from so only having gone to Colorado and then doing all of these coasts, you flew to Japan. Flew to Japan. So yeah, you're like you're that's just, the plan. Get, get, get the dictionary out, dummies, dummies, dummies. That's the plan. So, so then you came here, and then what kept you here? What made you sense? Well, Did you ever leave at that time? Oh, yeah. I, well, I, I, um, I kept a base here the whole time. Uh, Charlie uh, was able to get a, a contract with Newsweek before the, what was that, 88 Olympics in Korea, I think, mm -hmm. in Seoul. And so he, well, he went over to Seoul, and that was going to be a jump-off point. And so he had a good uh, contract for them. Both of us sort of made our... Mark here, and in, in a sense, um, from eighty to about eighty four, you're trying to figure out how to how to work here. I think really, you know, you're um, um, we're having at that time we have exhibitions to get work. So we were, had a sponsorship with uh, Nikon Camera, and you know, which meant service. You guys were working as a team. We worked as a team. We worked okay. separately. Okay. You know, uh, we did a lot of work as a team in the sense that I was really, uh, my specialty is usually with people, and he was with uh, kind of the mechanics of things. So okay. at that time, the military was the story in the Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. And so we realized, wow, you know, with the, the new aircraft, the SR-71 mm -hmm. was, was in its last, on its last leg. Man, we went down for that kind of stuff. We'd take flights. And by his dad being in the Air Force, he knew how to talk that Air Force talk, you know. At that time, we, we uh, the gunny sergeant, when we first came here, was a guy named Bob Green. I don't know if you know him. He's a Marine. Mm -hmm. That was at the old Sano Hotel that was now torn down. Yeah, that was right. And so we met Bob, and Bob really was great. He um, he had had um, jumped the gun to get into World War II, enlisted when he was about 17. 
And then he was in Korea, and then he went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he told his stories, and I used, uh, I do a little bit of writing odds and ends, but Bob told the best story ever, and uh, to me, as a matter of fact, he said I was, he was in Korea, and, and he was, we were on our way to Korea because we were going to do some of those team spirits, and we were flying, doing, doing all those flyovers and uh, traveling with the tank guys that were training, and that was just a playground for us. But Bob said, I was laying there, you know, and uh, these guys weren't friendly. They weren't friendly. You couldn't, you couldn't talk to them at all. They'd just shoot at you. you just raise up. And he said, um, I'd take my hat and I'd stick it up there and they'd shoot at it, you know. And uh, I wasn't paying attention and somebody shot me. And I go, oh man, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. And I grabbed my arm, I grabbed my stomach, I'm dead. And my friend said, what's wrong with you, Bob? He says, I'm dead, stop talking to me, I'm dead. And, uh, well, they got tired of hearing me say I'm dead because I wouldn't die and I got to feeling around, had all my clothes and there was the bullet. It hit something. Yeah, it, it, it was. It didn't have enough power in oh, it. It was a long shot, oh. and it had gone through all of his clothes. Right, but and it just wrapped up. Oh wow! And he said, well, after after that, they gave me so much of a hard time. I wish I would have been dead. <laughs> <laughs> that was my great story. I, I, I thought, wow, I'm gonna use that in a story somewhere, you know, writing or whatever. But anyway, we had a chance to do that. We were up there with on the, uh, my a lot of good friends with Brad Martin and I got in a huge automobile accident coming back from the, the 38th parallel. We're in one of those little kimchi cabs, a little small old cabs, you know, and it was overloaded and I it was snowing. We'd been up there and I was photographing, we were photographing the, the uh, security details and he was doing some info. And we're coming around a curve and that just thing just flipped Good over. Door. And um, it knocked Brad out. And Brad uh, is a, a big guy. He's about six feet four and mm -hmm. weighs, you know, 600 pounds probably. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got a pound for every inch. And I couldn't get him out. And the taxi driver didn't get him out. And the taxi driver's yelling, the car's going to explode. Mm -hmm. But the car was just slowly, I was worried because the car was slowly just scooting, just slipping down the mountainside of the road where it was turning turn over. Right. So we finally got our stuff out. We got got Brad out, and he was really dazed. And um, the driver's yelling, you know, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And, and Brad was yelling back at him in mixed Korean. And mm -hmm. um, next thing you know, another taxi came by, and we just flagged him down and got in and left that guy with his car. We mm -hmm. said, there are a bunch of North right. Koreans around here. Get them to help you with your car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Crazy things wow. like that. Those are like Korea, you know, stories. So you did that for that long, and then what got you into being Ramon and Steve? Uh, well, I, I worked uh, part time for a subsidiary of a Sony Music Company, and right. so uh, backing up with various bands that would come over and guys out here and, and uh, working. How'd you get and, that job? Um, it was it was odd. I was uh, photographing some uh, musicians in uh, Mississippi at a big festival and um, this group came and they actually had this Japanese guy singing with them, Toru Oki, an uh, interesting guy out here. And um, the interpreter uh, with him was a real nice guy named uh, Shima. And we just got to talking a little bit and he said, uh, I said, you know, I'm, I'm based out of, out of Japan. He said, you are? Yeah, I said, yeah. And so we got to talk. I said, well, let's, let's have a drink or something. I can go out. We all have a drink and we're in this little bar and uh, they have this Mexican mariachi type band, which were all guys from the Philippines, I think. <laughs> but uh, they were nice guys, you know. And so it happened, just happened that uh, their main sponsor, who was a guy with uh, the Yomuri uh, baseball team, was there and they, uh, he asked them to play a song. He asked my friend to sing. And he said, Steve, you gotta help me. You gotta come out with these guys. We gotta do a blues song for you know my, my friend, you know, my sponsor. And I said, Yeah, oh, okay, sure. I, I, I had some hearts in my bag, you know. And uh, so we go out and we all kind of settle up on a key and a kind of a beat. And uh, we go back in and we, we do a song. And then everybody loved it. So we did another song. And he said, Okay. We, you have to play with me. I said, okay. So from then on, I was hired and exactly. I started touring. That was about 1982 or so, something like that. 82, I guess, 82 or three. 
And so, because you've been here, but now you're back. In, that's back in Mississippi. Well, well no, no, I was back over here. I, I, no, I, no, I, no, I, no, I I'm sorry. In, in, you met uh, him. I met him in, 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 in the end of '81, summer of '81. I came back, uh, okay. back over. So right. um, we ended up meeting up, and so mm. that was a fun. And you started working with him from that time on. So go around and I was announcing, you know, doing that announcing. Nice guy, real, you know, it was good. He liked the blues. He was, he liked the New York feel of things. I mean, that was a sales point, you know. Mm-hmm. Nobody in Mississippi didn't, you know, every, every, mm-hmm. everybody says, talk all your. This train, right, right. So, okay. But, uh, yeah, so that was the deal. And uh, I had been sitting in with some people around here. But, you know, I mean, I'll be I'm horrible, 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 you know. Still pretty horrible, but uh, I, get, I get hired to clear the room. Okay. Yeah. So when did, when did you really get to where you felt like you got your fame, your, 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 your claim to fame as a blues singer in Japan? Oh, in Japan, um, I guess probably that... That had started. I mean, everything had to change. So by the '90s, I guess late '90s would have would have been when that was going on. When places opened up that were more accommodating to uh, live music mm-hmm. played by mm-hmm. foreigners, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, until that time, you we had to play the uh, on the circuit, and the circuit that I was on was a, a pretty controlled circuit. We were playing like a Yokohama Stadium or those kind of big big shows. Which is real set uh, or a dinner show, hotel dinner shows where you made your money. You go down to Kyushu and you play a hotel, and I was just a part of the band. You know, it wasn't my music. I, you know, uh, some of it I like, some you don't. It, but I was just a gun for hire, and uh, I was doing voiceovers for you know those times. You could do voiceovers for movies uh, on, or games or commercials or those kind of things. And so I would always do the. Uh, old Chinese man, mm-hmm. little sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you get down, that was, you. That was my thing. That I was, was just waiting. I'm like, like the, like, like the triangle player. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so then you decided you were going to make yourself a band. Uh, well, because you're, you're solo I, act mostly. I, I do. I um, I had covered. You know, we, I was saying in the in the Philippines when. Marcos was kicked out and Corey Aquino came in, the whole people power. We were there. And from there, I started um, working in Southeast Asia covering conflicts. There was a lot of things boiling up. And so I worked in Burma off and on covering the Civil War there for about three or four years. And again, music uh, saved me more times than I like like to, to admit, you know, on times when we were just probably going to get shot. Um, things just turned in such a way that you know you could you could play the last the thing that that happened i, I wear a hat all the time i mean I, we have that follicle impairment mm-hmm. what i caught was a uh, shrapnel in the top of the, the head across uh, here and so where um, was this where, where that was in burma mm-hmm. uh, the last time uh we, we, uh what had happened we were uh I had been covering several of the minority areas, uh, and not just me alone, but I had had a contract to do that. And uh, we were being, um, I met several guys who were forward observers that were trying to hold a position. And they were really funny cats. I mean, to be a forward guy, I mean, you're, you're like having people shoot artillery over your head, so you can't be exactly in your right mind all the time. And so these guys were up calling in artillery, the artillery, and the artillery was uh, two guys with a homemade mortar. That was the artillery. And that's so unpredictable. It's like shooting skyrockets for Roman candles, you know. I mean, uh, really a Roman candle is more accurate than the, their mortar fire. And so these guys would be just high as a kite, and it's noisy, and so they didn't have anything for their ears, so they take cigarettes, and stick in their ears, okay. and so the cigarette filters would kind of protect your ears. So you're you're in the middle of this thing. It's like being in a weird movie. So you got guys with guns, some with lit cigarettes. They're smoking. And they stick the cigarette in their ear. It's on fire, you know, as they're shooting mortar rounds, trying to make sure they've got enough um, explosive pack to it to propel it over the mountain where the guy's calling it. Sometimes they don't get there. <laughs> You know, and the poor guys, you, you almost hit me, you're trying to tell me. Like this. So anyway, we're about to be overrun, and there's no place. We're backed up against a river with uh, the Thai, with some Thai Special Forces guys on this side, 
who have decided we're not going to come back across. And the, the Burmese military are about to just take over, and that was just going to be it. So these guys, the Burmese, are shooting mortar rounds, and they would land, and these, they had two guys who would run out with gloves on, pick up these hot rounds before they explode. A lot of them on a timer, and they're going to explode. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to explode in the air, but they hit the ground because they didn't shoot them high enough. So you can hear them tick, mm -hmm. and you're just hoping you're counting off enough. So they grab these hot rounds, rearm them, and try and shoot them back before they explode. I mean, you know, what kind of nut mm. cases? So you working for, who are you working for? At that time, I was working for a magazine called Views, uh, Kodansha Publishing Kodansha. Company. Kodansha. And then uh, part of it ran in Time. I had a little, mm -hmm. little string of contract with Time Magazine then. So anyway, things are going on, and uh, we're running out of rounds. And all we have are phosphorus rounds, which mm -hmm. don't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, a lot of them, they can't get them, they just poop out the end of the mm -hmm. tube. And so the guy in charge, the Sarge, kind of came over to me and he says, I see, 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 you gotta play music, gotta play music, gotta play music. I said, play music, man, we're fixing to be overrun. He says, yeah, gotta play music. So I started playing some music. These guys were calling in request. So the one guy on the highest point, he loved country music. Voice of America, VOA, played lots of old country music. It was like being back in the late 50s or 60s to hear their playlist. A lot of Hank Williams, a lot of various things. And so he wanted to hear a Hank Williams song or a, uh, another guy wanted to hear Stand By Your Man, and all this. I said, I tell you what, fellas, how about You Are My Sunshine? And so I started playing. Oh, I like that song. And they all start singing along, You Are My Sunshine. And goodness gracious, the guy that could speak English on the other side, he started talking. They were breaking in on, on the radio channel and saying, okay, we have a request. And then the guy says, give me that monkey. He says, you dog, we don't want any requests from you. We are going to kill you. He goes, if you don't let him play, we will kill you. Okay, play. play. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat there playing. Over a speaker system? No, it's over a walkie-talkie. You know those old oh, walkie oh, 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 little walkie-talkies? Oh, you see that? Like, they're, they're, oh. they're breaking all the channels. It's called an open channel. Long <laughs> antenna. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there, the guy's holding the walkie-talkie. I'm playing. And what everybody was doing, they were breaking the camp down. And they were trying to slip down the river. And I played about 35 minutes, cordite in the air. It was horrible. I had gotten hit in the head when the explosion. So my, you know, blood. Yeah, my friend said, blood, blood came down. He says, you still back. playing? Uh, I was, I was playing. I had to play. I had to Even play. more. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the blood come down. It, you know, at, at the time, you're all keyed up. You don't right, just sitting here. Yeah, right. And so, um, yeah, so anyway, we're, we're playing. And these guys are slipping on down. They had some bamboo rafts. And they're move, moving out. And so when they'd all been able to go and the forward guys were able to get down, they were the last ones to, to leave. And so we pulled on out, went down, oh, about oh, three, four, five miles to a, an encampment that was in the bend of the river off away from everything, where it's kind of a neutral area. There's no, yeah, no there's there. a, hot, a field hospital there. Mm -hmm. And so we stayed at the field hospital for a couple of days when it came safe to exfiltrate back across the, the border. I had crossed that border so many times. The very first time I, I crossed my guide, who was, ah, you know, I should have known better, but he got arrested right off the bat. And um, so I, I asked the, this, this was in about 19, what, 86 or so, 80, 86, early 86. I was going in for the dry season offensive and I, I was gonna miss my rendezvous point and so, they said, well, the only thing you can do is you better go up to this um, uh, monastery that's up high on this, this mountainside. You gotta make your way up there. So I hired a little motorcycle driver to take me up. So I go all the way up, all the way up. And I, I talk, and we have to have some tea. And the sun's just beginning to rise. And I mean, you know, I've, I've, gotta meet, I've gotta meet my boat. I've gotta figure out. And it's kind of driving me nuts. And the guy's saying, Oh, just a moment, one moment. He's a young guy, you know, one moment. And uh, I look out, and there are all these, um, I guess they're called amas. I'm not sure anyway. They're, they're women, kind of uh, nuns, uh, you know, who take care of this area. They live in this monastery, and they've been a sweep. And they're all there with their brooms. Must have been about 35 of them. Mm -hmm. Older 
uh, women, females. Mm -hmm. And um, so he has this record player hanging up underneath this big speaker. And so he turns it on, of course, on top of the, um, the big monastery, these big giant speakers that blast out into the whole valley. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, wow, I wonder if it's going to be a speech or maybe some sort of nice uh, temple music, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it goes, it's feeding back a little bit and kind of adjusts it and gets it going. And there's a record on there. And so he looks down at it and uh, he sits it down and you just hear the warp sound. And it's like really amplified and it's coming out. The sun's rising, these women are, are waiting. Can you imagine what the song was? It was the Bee Gees, Staying Alive. Staying Alive. <laughs> <laughs> Staying Alive, Staying Alive. Oh my gosh, that was just too much. I thought, where's Francis Ford Coppola? This is too much, this is Apocalypse Now, you know. Yeah, sure is. But it was great. I mean, the guy was very kind to me. After that, um, we talked for a little while. Mm -hmm. he, he knew who I was meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to get a message and delay by a day to so that we could arrange and that was okay. I was doing that was a story that was already sold. I was doing a thing on their training, what they what they trained with, and the fact that they um, they ran this their training program like the British style uh, military uh, training back when Burma was was uh, pre. A war colony, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they had all of these old, uh, beat up weapons that they trained with, and that kind of thing. But they also had uh, music, so you had a time for everything. You had the training time, or whatever, and the music time, and everybody had to do something. You had to sing mm -hmm. a song, you had to play, mm -hmm. and uh, you might have to play along. Mm -hmm. I could never quite catch their tuning, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit of a different, different thing. thing. And again, it gets, you know, tuning or sound gets back to the cadence of the language, you right. know. And also the environment you grew up in. Yeah, like yeah. you said, the river and the wind and everything. So, right. so what do you have for the future? Since well, we have plenty of yeah, from this time on. I, well, we just try, I'm, we're trying to make it through this, this thing and be like Willie, not make any more scary stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, things have changed. Now, you know, I grew up playing uh, music that was somewhat danceable uh, for people who did dance and who, mm -hmm. and we had a, a, a chance to say that, um, you, did you hear that on the radio? Or are you waiting for the, but we don't really have that. I mean, I don't want to go all negative uh, about that because the, the time has changed. That's a different thing. But um, what I'm trying to do is to bring along, to bring in uh, younger folks who may be interested in what I'm doing. I do workshops, I'm gonna be doing a workshop at, a, um, let's see, this coming week for a bunch of young guys who are on fast track to Harvard and MIT and this kind of thing. It's a place, uh, Kaisei, uh, Academy. These are Japanese. They're all Japanese, but they are. Wow, their English is great and their knowledge is good. They're they're hungry for stuff. And but one of the things they 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 don't usually have is a, a sense of uh, timing and rhythm because they they study a lot and they do a lot of things, but uh, musical timing. Now they have the top uh, juggling team in all of Japan. They they win all the awards in that. And uh, back when uh, Mrs. Uh, Kennedy was the ambassador, I was um, lucky enough to have the opportunity to produce the show to welcome her. And so uh, their security was so tight, they wouldn't let me go in to, to supervise the young guys. And so I decided to let the young guys go go at it. So they came to me and they go, oh, Mr. Steve, I got hired a bunch of guys to juggle. I said, oh, Mr. Steve, we're going to do magic too. I said, that's great. We're going to use fire. Oh, that's going to be wonderful. Well, in the rider from the D Department of State was absolutely no fire, right, right. No, no flying objects, <laughs> right, <laughs> no surprises, no noises. It was great. The, they they, allowed, they, they, they allowed Well, they didn't know what was going to go on, and it was already done before they could, they could anything. do anything. But they rushed them on out of the room. They go, oh, it was so much fun, Mr. Steve. Yeah. So I said, hey, good for you. 
They you didn't get a chance to see it. I didn't get well. I, I produced. I knew what they were going to do, right, but right. I couldn't see Mrs. Kennedy. When it was, right. She was sort of a. Uh, she was very, very. Uh, she was in a bubble. Her. She, was she a, kept herself in a bubble because I was here during that time. Yeah. And she, I think her staff became really small. Yeah. She stayed in the bubble, that's for sure. But she used to come here to work out almost every day. Yeah. I mean, really you could run, in, you could run think, into her and see her, no yeah. problem. But as yeah. far as who she invited to come here right. in her group, very small. It was small. And I, I would but, think that that would be, wow, I, but she's, I can't imagine that. But they say that she's the closest to royalty the U.S. has. The right, family. right, right. I guess, guess we considered our royal family, the yeah. Kennedys. So, and, and how unfortunate. To the get to time. that, to, you know, elevated area. So that's right. But anyway, on on things, I, I look at that as like, okay, maybe our our mission is to um, to to try and be our best self on our worst day. And we we know uh, we know we've had some bad days, but I, I suppose we haven't faced our worst day. Mm-hmm. What I think about this time, changing gears a little bit about what we see, is that this idea with COVID has caused us to face our own. Uh, shall we say, uh, depression, our own 1929 crash, our 1930s survival. And I hope that the answer out of it is not going to be a world war. Mm-hmm. I mean, in in the sense of to, to start things. Who would have ever thought that, you know, a damn bat was going to shut down the world, you know? I uh, I can just, I, I, I can imagine my my old blues friends, who I would go and see, Jack Owens for one, who... Uh, we would sit out and, and on his porch and play. He was a uh, friend of Skip James who was brought forward in the revival and, and uh, a lot of his songs were covered by European bands and whatnot. But anyway, I can imagine Jack as he's sitting out there with his pistol who would say, he'd say, Jack, you know, can you imagine that a bat has flown out of China and wrecked the whole world? And Jack's answer would be, well, why didn't you just shoot it? You know, oh, well, Jack is not going to be that easy, you know. But the problem uh, being for all of us is is exactly that. It's uh, we're not going to shoot something, of course, but we have to stop blaming uh, others, other people, other nations. Yeah, but, but it's here, and uh, now we've got to be proactive and positive. I think we we've got to say, all right, what are we going to do about it? Uh, how can we be better thinkers? How can we be better in our community? Uh, what What is it that we need now? Because what this has allowed us to do, I, I, I have a mask on most of the time, you too. Mm-hmm. So nobody sees you smile. You, you accidentally bump into somebody and they turn around. Well, you can't see anything except their eyes. You don't know if they're afraid or surprised or angry. And they don't know the same. Uh, you know, we need a, I don't know, maybe we need a little electric thing, but a smile. They have, they have masks like that. It's like, like, oh, <laughs> you know. But, um, you know, I think that that's one of our challenges. And in, and for me, being a, a musician, I mean, that's what I have turned to now. Um, I'm not much on the digital uh, neighborhood of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of recycling some of the uh, the photographs and photographic projects that I've been doing uh, in order to perhaps be a better educator as I uh, bring music forward, to bring more uh, humor perhaps, uh, more information as to why something's how it is so that maybe you'll understand what it is you're doing. And so that's, that's part of what's happening. The uh, final point, depending on how this goes, the uh, American Chamber of Commerce Japan is going to have a, uh, an online auction. And so I I've, have I've a few of my books that I'm going to uh, put into that. What has happened, the book came out in the 90s and due to kind of, as we find the difficulty around the world is communication. Due to communication between the gallery that produced my book the publishing company and the distributor, the books were, um, only half of them were released. And they were shipped off to Europe, <clears throat> mostly, and New York. I didn't get many copies of the book. Mm. Then by the time that we could get copies, there was a huge bill to be paid to the distribution network, and the books were destroyed. 
And so <clears throat> uh, that was a horrible thing. So it was a very limited uh, <clears throat> art edition. So when the gallery closed, uh, the final gallery closed here in Tokyo, that produced the book, they found a few mislabeled copies, about 30, and they gave them to me. And so the, <clears throat> that's allowed me to have about 10 that I can put in this uh, auction. Um, what had happened, the books were bought up by collectors and sold for as much as $1,000 a copy because it was, it can, at that time, it was one of the few documents on uh, the blues and on Mississippi uh, that was so well uh, made. Uh, not because I did it, but because it was well printed, it was a hardback, and uh, it's, they're not mm -hmm. a so, um, we'll see what happens. Do right. you have any in comments? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Lance, thank you so very much for yeah, making and time and taking time, yeah. you know, for, for me. Yeah. Uh, I hope I didn't leave you like the, the uh, Southern preacher. Uh, <laughs> my goodness, his, his man was in the hospital and he went to see him <clears throat> and he had tubes coming out of every place uh, all over his body. And the preacher came up to him and he said, Oh, brother, I'm going to have to pray for you. And before the, the fellow could just say anything, because that tube there, the preacher knelt down and started praying for the man. And goodness gracious, he started hitting the preacher on the head and the side and pointing to a pad and a pen. So the preacher handed him the pad and the pen and quickly wrote something, and the poor brother died. A few days later, they're having the funeral for him, and the preacher said, uh, you know, uh, we, we're sad to lose our friend and the community, but I have his last words right here. I hadn't even read him yet, and he gets his words. That says, Brother Preacher, please stand up. You're kneeling on my air hose. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope I hadn't been kneeling on the air hose yeah. too long. <laughs> Steve, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Anytime. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for watching this podcast. Make sure you press like, subscribe. And never forget, it's all on the way. Continue to reach for the stars, and you're too blessed to be stressed.